Okay, we're here on uh, October 28th, 2016. Uh, we're interviewing Debbie Hanrahan, a longtime activist, 50 plus years uh, in anti war and uh, civil rights, anti freeway, and you name it, she's been involved in it. Uh, my name is John Hanrahan. I happen to be her husband and uh, and intern, I guess, on some of these projects. And we're, Eddie Becker will be filming this interview today, and also Ann Gallivan from our project. This is a project, The Lessons of the 60s, uh, Project of Institute for Policy Studies. And uh, I guess we're ready to roll with the questions then. Uh, so just, we'll go over your early life just fairly briefly, uh, but you were, where were you born and uh, what were, your, who were your parents, who, what influences did you have growing up? Um, I grew up not far from here in Bethesda, Maryland and Chevy Chase, Maryland. I happened to go and <coughs> I attended school in Washington, D.C. because my father was a teacher and we got a free ride at the school. So I always thought of myself as a Washingtonian and always wanted to be a Washingtonian, but I slept in Maryland. Um, John and I were talking last night and I want to credit him with my remembering so much stuff because I honestly had forgotten. I'm, I'm in an advanced age of late 70s and, and over the years things pile up and you really don't keep track of them. But, uh, and as someone told me this morning, I tend to be someone who wants to look forward. I don't really want to look backwards because I want to believe that I still have more things to do. Um, but I know that when I was 12, I did something startling. I went to dinner with my father, who was the was a principal at the time and was responsible for this kid whose father was the ambassador to Iran. And when the father came back, he invited my father to dinner. My mother didn't go, so he took me. And I remember saying at the dinner, there was a you know, big table, a lot of people we didn't know. They just sort of included us as a nice uh, gesture. And they were talking about uh, the Negro problem. And I said, we didn't treat black people fairly or Negroes fairly and this table just went silent. I do not know where that came from. My father did not berate me going home. In fact, he never even mentioned it again. But somewhere in my background, I knew that the oppression of black people was wrong and even, and from really from high school and college on, I wanted to do something about it as a privileged white person. Yeah, you were influenced by a, one of your high school teachers. Yes. Actually, you said yes. Yeah. Uh, Dick Abel, a fabulous teacher who went on to uh, Walt Whitman and influenced many people, including adults that I have met here in Washington who are activists as a result of this teacher. Um, and then I went to college and it was a girls college, Skidmore College. It wasn't very, I didn't enjoy it too much, but I did participate in picket lines at the five and dime and stuff like that. Uh, but the, it was a nascent civil rights movement at that time. But I, I knew going up in a Jim Crow area where there was still segregated everything, that what we were doing was wrong. And uh, I wanted, I don't, I just knew I wanted to do something about it. And at that time, women like me, you would get invited to dinner and so you'd make a snarky comment about racism or something and then you'd never get invited again or somebody would talk to you about joining something and you'd say, well, how many black people do you have as members? And you'd never get invited. I mean, that was the extent of my activism I at the college age. After college, you uh, went to work for a congressman uh, or a senator, I'm sorry, first. How did that all come in? come about? Did somebody recruit? We were, we were trying to remember. I, I may have just walked into the office. In those days, the Senate was an open building. You didn't have to have an ID. I may have, I may have heard about him, salt and straw. I don't know. But anyway, I got a job. Republican. Yeah, I got a job opening his mail and sorting his mail and generally being the low person on the totem pole. And then you went to work for Congressman uh, James Corman, Democrat of California. Yeah. And what did you do for him? And then tell about the March on Washington and the Congress. Oh, that was a step up. I, I began answering letters <laughs> and doing research and did some constituent service. Very, very, very nice man. Had grown up very poor, was very dedicated to uh, promoting the welfare of people who didn't have very much going for them. Um, he, um, uh, nevertheless, when I told him, or I told someone on the staff I was going to the March on Washington, the congressman came to me personally and said he, had, he wished I wouldn't go. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, it's going to be dangerous and it's going to be riotous and who knows what it's going to be like out there and you're just this woman. 
young woman. Uh, and I said, thank you very much. And I went anyway. And it was the emptiest Washington, D.C. has ever been. I got in my little car out in Maryland. I drove right up Connecticut Avenue. I parked on Lincoln Memorial Service a Circle. And I walked up the back of Lincoln Memorial. And I thought nobody was coming. I thought it was a, a failure. And I looked out. And there was a sea, as far as the eye could go, of thousands of people. And I made the mistake of being too close to the memorial. So I really didn't get the gist of the speeches until later when I read them. But it was, a, it, it was the most extraordinary event I'd ever attended up to that point in my life. While you were working for the congressman, there, there was something like a lawyer. There yeah. came a time when you <laughs> okay. went uh, on some assignment for him in Virginia. And tell, yeah. tell me what happened, right. what, what that was about. Well, know, was knowing of my interests, he, he could not keep an appointment in Danville, Virginia to interview somebody about the civil rights legislation, which was, was 1963 too. Yeah, right? thank so, you, honey. Yeah. Which was under uh, advisement. So I went down with a guy who was his legislative assistant, and we tried to keep our appointment with this person. I don't even remember who it was. In the meantime, Martin Luther King was in town, coming to town, big demonstration that night, and suddenly the whole town was under arrest. We were stockaded in some area behind the town, and um, we actually, we never, felt fr uh, we never felt unsafe, nobody ever did anything to us. We were just held there for half a day. And then I went home, and a friend of mine, Larry Aronson, uh, was reading the New York Times and tried to be helpful and called my parents and told them that I had been held, I had been arrested in Virginia. They were in Pennsylvania on vacation, and they were, what is this? And uh, so I got on the front page of the New York Times for doing absolutely nothing. Sunday front page, New York Times, yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah, and and you can Google it. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, right. But it, so you try so hard to get into, you know, get some news, and you don't get anything, and then, you know. So sometime shortly after that, uh, 1964, you uh, joined the Peace Corps. How, how did you come to join the Peace Corps, and what was, you know, what was going um, on? I, th I. Th well, I, of course, everybody likes to travel. And it was sort of in the air. It was a Kennedy thing. Uh, I wasn't too old to go. And I, I picked, this, I'm ashamed to tell you this, but I picked Chile because it's the furthest country away from the United States. And when you come home from the Peace Corps, you get a ticket that takes you all the way up. And I had heard the Peace Corps volunteers cash in their plane ticket and then take the bus north. And it, you can spend a half a year doing that. And I thought, hmm, that's what I want to do. So. And um, somebody, you had talked to some return Peace Corps volunteers who were enthusiastic. Oh yes, yeah. John Coyne and others, they were Ethiopia One returnees and I really liked them and I, they had a terrific time and they were very, they were not internationalists per se, but they really knew something that I didn't know about another country and I, and I recognize that. I mean as a tourist you get a certain amount of knowledge, but they really knew their country. And I thought that was a very useful thing. So, so you were a, uh, you went to where in Chile and what, what was your project I was in there? the south of Chile, in mm -hmm. uh, thousand kilometers from the capital. I was in the uh, Temuco, which was the provincial capital. My project was actually very good, very outstanding. We had the first rural mobile birth control program in the country. The Peace Corps didn't like it. They said, as long as you don't tell anybody, we won't stop you from doing it. Um, and we, the Dr. Lopez, who ran the program, had been trained at Columbia Hospital for Women in New York, and she went to Temuco and she set up this wonderful thing, and she used IUDs uh, as the contraceptive, and we could not meet the demand. We could not, mm -hmm. we could not transport people enough mm -hmm. to the to the uh, hospital. For and, the, the and this was an area of big. Fundos and a lot yeah. of uh, yeah. Indian, uh, Mapuche Indians. Uh, this would have been 1964. You were in the Peace Corps 1964 to 66. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. I'll say, ask the question again. Well, the, the, in the area, there was, I mean, I, I guess to phrase it another way, sort of a real class divide between the big oh. fundo owners and the. Yes. And the campesinos, yes. the Mapuche Indians, and, yeah. and your project um, 
they they sometimes would keep people from even oh, I, participating. I developed a huge dislike and often a hatred for the uh, plantation owners. We had this uh, rubella uh, program for inoculating children. Rubella in Chile was a killer. It actually killed children. I don't know why we don't have that strain here, but there it, it was a death sentence. And we would have the mothers and the children come down to the gates of the fundos and Either we would do the injecting or the doctors would do it. We had two uh, Chilean doctors in our little town. And sometimes the owners would not permit the mothers to come down. Therefore, probably assuring that one of their kids was going to die. And I, I, I thought it was unforgivable. And, uh, but it was there that just was emblematic of their attitude toward the campesinos that made their farms work and make them a lot of money. Sort of a double question, so we cover a lot of ground. Uh, that um, as a result of what you experienced in Chile during that project, how did that inform you about uh, uh, people in other countries, foreign, U.S. foreign policy, and then mention the uh, incident with the contribution you made to it? Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Well, um, first of all, you, you ran smack into the class system. I mean, you, you hear that in America we have this class system, but it, when you're in the middle of it, you don't get it so clearly. But in Chile, you saw an up, a very striated society, and it, so when you came home, and suddenly I realized who was in what classification in my own country. But um, when uh, there was this wonderful woman in my little town who wanted to be the intendente, I gave her 50 what, scoots. What is that? Uh, that was like the little mayor. Little mayor didn't, okay. didn't have any power, but for ceremonial purposes and stuff, but she was brilliant. She was half Swiss. Her father was a uh, criminal who had been deported from Switzerland, and he went to Chile, married a Chilean woman, and produced uh, this gal and her sister. And um, I gave her 50 scudos, which was one fourth of my monthly, you know, salary that I got from the Peace Corps. So it was, wasn't much money. Somehow the Peace Corps found out about it, and they were going to send me home because I had gotten involved in local politics, and they didn't approve of that. When I got home. I picked up the Nation magazine, and what do I read about? Um, Eduardo Frey, who's up for re-election, was re-elected by a program, with the help of a program that I was part of, that the Peace Corps was running, which was the mother, it was a mother's center with little um, sewing machines that we gave out to people, all to support Frey's re-election, and I was part of that, and yet my little 50 Escudos was a no-no. So and, and you had no idea of this no this isolated I, I, area. it was part Sorry. of AID and you know I just didn't know how we were being used and this this went on in a much greater degree I mean I just wasn't aware of all the little programs that we were finagling to support this guy's re-election so yeah. you, um, you left the Peace Corps a little early in 1966 because your father was ill back home and you right. came back to care for him then. yes yeah I did I nursed my father for maybe seven or eight months uh, unfortunately, he died, and then um, I wasn't really off the hook then because then my mom just became very ill from caring for my father, and so she had to be hospitalized. So I was really house sitting. I was taking care of my dad, then she was hospitalized, and I was house sitting. And it was at that time that this guy I had gone to high school with asked me to come and work on the Dump Johnson. So movement. this had been 1967, then yeah. probably, yeah. And he, um, he was a very interesting guy. I, I can't say that I really liked him, but he was really, really interesting. And it sounded like, a, and I had been really housebound for quite a while, and I wanted to get out and do something. So I went to New York. He had this very small apartment, and there were three men and myself. So they had started the Dump Johnson movement. And I was like the woman who answered the phone. And in those days, they did not have cell phones. So, um, what was the name of the guy who the leader of it? Al Lowenstein. Al yeah. Lowenstein would go around and talk to college presidents all over the country about the Vietnam War and why it had to be stopped and why they had to oppose it. And then, as he was getting on the plane to go to his next college, he would call me on the phone and report who had supported him, who they were, what they're on. So I was, I mean, cell phones are a great thing, <laughs> but he could never find a pay phone and it was just, it was very hectic and I'd get calls at three or four in the morning. I mean, I slept with the phone on my ear. He was speaking to college students also yes, too. Yes, he was yes, college right, yeah. president, students, college professors. I mean, he got, I remember a guy who was a pizza mogul who he 
you know, he was so excited because he had lined them up. Um, but it was, it was what they call, what do they call those things, a boiler room. I mean, I went from this quiet environment with sick people to this very intense, tiny, thing. and oh, and Bella Absug would call me all the time. What is, well, this Allard Lowenstein saying, what is you? Bella Absug, once she got, you could not get her to stop. Now, these were three driven men. And I really, I- Do you want I, to name the first one just for the record? Oh, uh, it was, uh, the, the friend that called me was um, uh, Howard Harold Ickes. The second one was Curtis Gans, and the real leader was uh, Allard Lowenstein. All very intense men. Uh, and I bring all this up not to criticize them in any way, but to say, I was prepared for anything when I came back to Washington. I had been in the windstorm. <laughs> I mean, I, I had survived these three men, and nothing that, that you know, Julius Hobson or anybody else could say to me could match what I had been through with Bella Absug and these other guys. Cause tell they, tell them know. about the um, Lowenstein, the, the smoke and mirrors operation yeah. in some cases. Yeah. Uh, well, I was terrified of Lowenstein because he, he just brooked no dissent or, you know, you just did what he said. Okay, his father owned a restaurant out in Long Island. Some rich guy from Texas had put an ad in the New York Times saying, will donate $50,000 to an anti-war candidate. Lowenstein wanted to get that $50,000 for the Dump Johnson movement. In those days, they were beginning to think about um, Eugene McCarthy, about um, uh, the other guy, Henry, the great guy. Um, Who later, yep, the yeah. later came in late, Robert Kennedy. You mean. Robert Kennedy, but the third guy they were considering ran, did run for president mm -hmm. and did very badly. D.C. and Massachusetts voted for him. Oh, McGovern, yeah, McGovern. George McGovern, They, they course, were going yeah. around trying to find who, because they really believed they were going to get rid of Johnson. They needed a candidate. And um, so, he, and we needed money. We had no money. I mean, we couldn't even pay our phone bills. And so, um, we went to this restaurant, and uh, by that time, there was an office on Columbus Circle, and there were other volunteers in there, female volunteers. So the female volunteers were asked to come to this dinner and look very presentable and get dressed up. And then Lowenstein and Ickes and some few other people were there. And the guy from Texas comes, and I hear Lowenstein saying to him, well, we have this um, very big operation. We have computers that do our ads. And suddenly, I'm looking around at, um, my coworkers and saying, we don't have any computers. Where are the computers? They were, at, in those days, they raised money with full page ads in the New York Times, and you send in them $2 on this little coupon, and they would put your name in the ad. And then the ad would run a little coupon, and then you'd hopefully get enough coupons back so you could run it on in two weeks. Well, the names had to be correct, and they had to be alphabetized, and we would have one or 2,000 names sometimes. We and these other women, I and these other women, were losing our eyesight fixing these ads with all these names. So I was getting very angry. If we had a computer, what the hell was I doing? <laughs> I mean, I just, I mean, I believed him. He was so, such a good, you know, Sales bullshitter. Person, yeah. So then, the, the, at one point, one of them said to the other, let's go to the other table. And the guy wrote a check for $50,000 to the Dump Johnson movement. Yeah. That's so, see, and, and that's the kind of thing, do I consider that chicane or anything? No, it was just very clever, seizing the moment, you're desperate for money, and somehow you got it. And, um, and, and they expanded, and they eventually had a big conference, uh, was very successful, and uh, then Eugene McCarthy was, did become their candidate. So you, when you came back to Washington, uh, as you said, some very uh, driven people that you were working with there, but <laughs> Then you came right back and worked for uh, perhaps our greatest civil rights leader of yes, the city, he was. Uh, Julius Hobson. Yes. How did you come to uh, go to work for him? Well, um, there's a there's a woman in town that everybody knows, and uh, Susie. Sorry, I hate to interrupt, but you have to include the question in your answer. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Well, we have to also make sure you have the years. Yeah. Okay. Well, 67, 68. Yeah. Again. Right. Yeah. Um, I, there was a fa well, first of all, there was a family emergency, and I'm so glad there was because that brought me back to Washington, and I could say, this is nonsense. I'm going to die if I could keep up this, this project. And so I was looking around for something to do. I moved into D.C., into the bottom of a group house, and Two I just... Two doors away from here, by the way, at yeah. 1509 Q Street. Right. I, I've been stuck in the same location for 70 years or something. But anyway, so 
uh, Susie Soff at that time uh, said to me in passing, uh, there's this guy that wants to hire a secretary. Um, I don't want the job. Do you, are you interested? And I said, sure. I don't even know if I had his name. I had his address. I went to his office. I interviewed for the job. I got the job. And only later did I realize that I had the job of the century in many respects because I was working for Julius Hobson, who in, to my mind and to my perspective was the greatest civil rights leader in right. the city. Now, he wasn't everybody's cup of tea, but he certainly was mine. Yes, yeah, so this was a 67, 68. You, you having been in the Peace Corps, being away out of town a yeah. lot, weren't even aware of Julius Hobson's many no. achievements. And, no, no. Um, and, and Susie, to her credit, she told me nothing. I, I just saw a way to pay my rent, frankly. <laughs> I mean, that's what, I, that's what it was all about. Um, so what, what, made, uh, what, what did you do for Hobson, and what made him so special, and what was going on at the time in 19... 68, 67, 68, with, uh, with well, things there, he was involved there was an in. awful, he had an awful lot on his plate, but the things I remember, his, the accomplishments that I remember the most was his Hobson v. Hansen lawsuit, which came, which was, the appeal was announced early on in my working days there. That was a suit against the uh, uh, D.C. school system, various racial uh, And Hansen was the superintendent of right. education, mm -hmm. and insisted on preserving the stratified education system, which really put all the white people at the top and all the people, non-white people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it had been that way for time immemorial and nobody saw any reason to change it, but Hobson said we're going to change it and he said we're going to equalize expenditures between black schools and white schools and we're going to break this, these, the all black teachers and all black schools and all white teachers. And, and I mean he had the whole thing figured out and I didn't know this until recently when John was helping remind me what, of what I, my history is. He almost bankrupted himself on the lawsuit. I did not know that at the time. He never said that in the presence of me or anybody that came to talk to him about it. Mm -hmm. He was footing the bill for that lawsuit, which could have, I have no idea how much it was. And in ending the uh, track system, which you were just talking about, and equalizing things, there were some aspects of it that uh, did not go down well with certain people yes. in the black community. Yes, uh, as well as the white. And, and certainly the yeah. white community. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and that was the thing that endeared me to him because he was very, very consistent. He was an equal opportunity pisser offer. He didn't care if he took on the elite black community or the elite white community. If they were doing something wrong, he would go after them. And the black elite in this town, and we've talked about this today, actually, that we, we had a black elite in this town. We had a fairly well-to-do black community. Uh, and they had figured out how to preserve a part of the school system for their children and to the detriment of all the other children. And he thought that was wrong. And their Dunbar High School was the, it was the epitome of that select uh, uh, exclusive system for black people. So, you know, he had everybody against him. He had the um, uh, the black elite and the uh, and, and then generally just the white community because he was uh, doing the unspeakable. The, the day the decision came down, you were in the office oh, yeah. and expecting a lot of yeah. people calling to congratulate him. Yes, we've been called the day before saying the the decision is coming down. He didn't ask me, I mean, he, Hobson was very hard to read. You didn't know what he was expecting, but I was expecting uh, I'd be very busy answering the phone because people were going to call and say, great, well, look what you've done. The phone did not ring, which, which sort of suggests what I'm saying about him angering everybody equally is true. And he didn't care. He did not care. And I... He grew up in a family of educators, and I just learned that he talked about education all the time. So although he was not a teacher, he knew what a good school system should look like, right from his mother and his father. And he told me once that he had been informed by a teacher that he could be president of the United States. And I said, but Julius, you can't be president of the United States, you're black. And he said, the teachers, nope. I, they told me I could be president of the United States, and I believed it. 
So, this is a guy who lived on, who wanted to perfect a flawed um, cu culture, something for people, and he wanted everybody to get, he wanted everybody to share as they should. I mean, he, he was all about, he, he was a very brave man, just, very brave man. Just as an aside, of course, he, uh, he made no bones about it that he was an atheist, yeah. that he was a <laughs> Marxist, and yeah. insulted ministers on a regular basis, probably not the greatest yeah. path to becoming no. president, but <laughs> that sort of speaks yeah. to what he... Uh, yeah, what he, was, he was not a hypocrite. He refused to fudge it. And in this town, which is deeply religious, especially in the black quarters, that is, that is a red flag. You are asking for trouble. And uh, he didn't care. He was, he was very upset by the ministers who would have one, two, three offerings and one time he was invited to speak and he didn't even wait to speak. He just stood up and he said, you people are being robbed by this church and I will not be any part of it. And he walked out. So he, um, he, he you knew where he stood. Just, we'll move on from him in a, in a yeah. second. But uh, he, um, he was also, besides all the, the local things, and we aren't even touching on half of those, he was also yeah. involved in the anti-war movement. And, yes. and then I'd like to mention a couple of his... Uh, or one of his um, many uh, ploys, gimmicks, yeah. uh, sort of mm -hmm. a la what Allard Lowenstein did with the computers. Yeah, uh, sort yeah. Of. He was very, he, he reminded me of, of Sam Abbott because he would get a newspaper and he spread it out on his desk and he would read it from front to back. Sam Abbott being the uh, big anti-freeway. That's right. And person. they were allies and we'll talk about them later, but he really absorbed the daily newspaper, unlike anybody I've ever worked for or worked with. Uh, uh, and in terms of his um, shenanigans or his gimmicks, um, he had no money and, and, and he didn't want money in the various groups that he was part of. He felt money brought trouble. And I asked him once, one time he got like a $20,000 contribution from somebody. And I was really excited and I went into his office and I showed him, he said, I don't want it, send it back. Julius, why don't you want the money? Money brings trouble. It attracts the wrong kind of people. I know now who, who supports me because I don't have any money. He said, no, I don't, you know, whatever. And I, I, at the time, I thought he was nuts. Now I think he was a very, very wise man. I agree with that. And the, the ploy that, one of the, just one example of it with the, uh, the rat incident. Oh, right, okay. Um, because Julius was a, uh, uh, statistician and a researcher and everything Bec and because of, of uh, various court ordered uh, papers that told about a DC expenditures he knew that there was no money for rat abatement anywhere in the city except Georgetown so I mean he has to do something about that and um, he had a this little tiny green Volkswagen and he somehow he got a crate that you could see through and somebody gave him a rat and he put it in the crate and he said he was gathering rats from Anacostia and he was going to bring them over to Georgetown and let them free. And why was he doing this? Because they had no money for rat abatement in any part of the city except Ward 3 and so the abatement program would take care of the rats in Ward 3. He got money for the whole city. He hated rats. He was nowhere he was nowhere close to doing this. But it got I mean, I can't remember the press coverage, but everybody knows that story. I mean, it was a famous or infamous uh, Hobson um, uh, episode. And just to point out, this was a time uh, when we did not have a government. We eventually got an appointed city council yes. mayor before several years later getting right. an elected one. So he was operating s strictly on his, uh, yeah. his own. The, um, uh, the, the, on the, the public perception or the press perception, yeah. the white community perception of of, uh, of Hobson and many other black yeah. activists at the time was, these people are trouble. Uh, just just try a little bit about him in his private. Uh, uh, well, life. Uh, Julius Hobson again compared to the three guys I'd been in this boiler room with in New York was a true gentleman. I mean, he never raised his voice. He was just so patient. I didn't know anything about these studies that he was doing. He took me through them. Uh, he, he let me be, get involved with them. 
Um, he wore a very formal fedora hat. He always wore a coat and a tie and pants. He must have spent a fortune in cleaning bills. I mean, the guy was um, dapper, dapper. And, uh, he had a, and he also had a pipe in his mouth, which he used to chew on when he'd get really mad. And um, he was the antithesis of his public reputation. I mean, when people found out who I was working for, they'd say, oh my God, are you safe? Are you blah, blah, blah. Because when in his public speaking appearances, he was so angry and so driven to make his points that they just assumed in his office life or his personal life, he was the same way. Couldn't have been more different. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have been more different. In this same uh, period, and, and Sammy, of course, I mean, uh, Julius, of course, was involved in that, but uh, the, the freeway uh, fight that mm -hmm. lasted about 12 years, which mm -hmm. DC uh, activists, and, stopped the freeway in a movement that involved black and white and rich right. and poor across the city. Yep. And the little genius behind much of that was Sammy Abbott. And right. tell us about your involvement in the anti-freeway fight and a little about Sammy. And besides Sammy, there were other very prominent yeah. activists. Well, of, uh, if you were at all alive and breathing in those days and you were not involved in the freeway fight, you weren't with it. And so, you to a larger and lesser extent. Um, uh, the street action was, you know, Marion Barry and R Reginald Booker and all these who were um, chaining themselves to houses and generally getting a lot of attention by creating disturbances. And I, in those days, I was not, I don't think I'd, I'd never been arrested by that time. And so I wasn't really happy to, I didn't want to do that. Anyway, people were doing it so well, I didn't need to join him. But Hobson would come back from one, some of these demonstrations where they, where they would chain themselves to houses and laugh and laugh. And I said, what's so funny? He said, well, they didn't want to, in, in, uh, they didn't want to arrest Charles Kinsell and me, so we had to tiptoe around and, and climb into the paddy wagon because nobody would arrest us. He said, we changed ourselves. We and he said, I have to get arrested. I mean, I, 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 can't, I cannot get arrested and have all these other people be arrested. He said, it would be too embarrassing. So he, but he thought it was very funny. And um, he, he understood, like so many people at that time understood, that this freeway would have destroyed this city. And, and I want to remind people, whoever watched this film, that we are the only city on the East Coast to stop a major freeway from destroying their city. Mm -hmm. And it would have taken at least two to 4,000 houses down with it. And of course, you know what kind of neighborhoods, those were poor black neighborhoods, those yeah. houses were. Houses had already been boarded up, in fact, yes. in uh, yeah. Brookland. For, right, uh, right. Uh, for the thing. Uh, and um, how, so uh, Sammy Abbott, had very much the same sort of anger, yeah. but didn't he seem angrier most of the time where Julius was sometimes <laughs> relaxed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't speak to how, well, I, I saw Abbott in his office. didn't work directly with No, him. I yeah. saw Abbott in his office a few times, and he had that same habit of devouring the news. I mean, there was nothing that he wasn't up on. I mean, the guy, he was an artist, and he'd made himself an expert on uh, interstate commerce and every other damn thing having to do with freeways. Now, during and and uh, with uh, Hobson in the early '70s, then and people started turning their eyes a little bit toward electoral politics. We finally got a, an elected school board in 1969. Uh, 1971, we got this you know the, the non-voting delegate to Congress, and uh, Hobson uh, created with along with other people, Josephine Butler and. Uh, mm yourself and uh, many other people, Lou Aronica, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this, this D.C. statehood party, and he ran against Walter Fauntroy. Right. And from that point on, took statehood up as a major uh, issue. Yes. And Fauntroy, by the way, creamed him because Julius just insulted the churches <laughs> too much, at the, among other things yeah, in that campaign. Right. But, that uh, but that was, just tell about the, the those that early time in red, you know the Joe formation Butler, of the city. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there was this lovely woman named Josephine Butler who uh, in her own way was a genius she was very gentle she had at 14 started to work in a cafeteria she had married a guy who was abusive she'd gotten divorced at 16 she was a, a labor organizer 
And she was just the smartest, um, wisest person. And she, she was a humanizing person behind Hobson. They were a great team, in, in fact. And she did the, uh, the uh, everyday stuff of forming a party, creating a for party, registering the party, making sure the Board of Elections would accept people's registration in the party. And um, she, she did find employment at, with the DC Lung Association. So she actually had a job and had a source of income, which was very good because she spent most of her time on extracurricular well, things. In fact, in the yeah. late 50s and on into the 60s, she was very ill and was not participating yes. in anything. Yes, yeah. yes. She had a terribly hard life, terribly hard life. Mm -hmm. um, and she lived to be, I believe, 78. Some, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 78. Um, uh, I knew her, well, in this room where we're sitting, she called a meeting of the statehood party. You were on the uh, Central Committee Central or whatever committee. it was called. Such yeah. as it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was almost included the whole party at that time. Anyway, so we're sitting here and Joe said, I want you to meet this guy, Ed Guinan. Let me just interrupt. Yeah. That was, uh, this was in 1978 as the state okay. of movement was yeah. moving along. See, yeah. we've got so many years, honey. I, it's hard. Okay, 1978. And Joe Butler sang to maybe a dozen people, um, Ed Guinan is here and he wants us to support uh, an initiative to create for statehood for calling a constitutional for first voting on whether or not we want to call a constitutional convention mm -hmm. I mean and Ed Guinan was a Paulist uh, ex-Paulist yes. priest who had with um, what's his name Mitch Snyder had yes. formed right. citizen, um, community for creative nonviolence violence, yeah, yeah. So he had quite a reputation, and so we all sort of sat up really straight when he came into the room because um, he, was a, he was sort of well known. And he said, don't, I remember this, he said, don't look now, but I am going to fi fi file this initiative with the Board of Elections, and you can help me or not. And Rich Bruning, who represented Ward 1 on the uh, steering committee, is looking around and Joe is kind of panicked because she really thinks we're not ready or we can't really pull it off and if we fail it will push statehood back. Rich Bruning said this guy is going to do it we have to support him and that's what then wrecked all of our lives for the next year because we had to gather thousands of signatures in five of the eight wards to put this on the ballot and we could not let it fail. So we, uh, our schedule was kind of speeded up by this guy who comes, <laughs> who comes in from outside and says, I spent all summer researching this and we've got to have a constitutional convention for statehood. And it was a good thing that he did. Uh, you can argue a lot about it, but we did have a very fine um, constitutional convention with elected delegates and we produced a very fine uh, constitution, which was ratified by the citizens of the city. And it started with Guinan, and it was this ragtag statehood party which picked it up and went with it. And we all learned how to gather signatures. We didn't know how to do it, but we got very proficient. The, um, we might come back to that at, uh, yeah. at the end and just bring it down to the present day, but I was going to jump back uh, a little bit into uh, the, the 1968, um, approximately, uh, oh. when you somehow or another met a person named uh, Brent Dillingham oh, yeah. and um, subsequently uh, joined him in an uh, organization called Compeers on the break, Great Boycott and right. uh, a number of other things. But uh, you just described, uh, work, you were also working f with Brent and others on Eugene McCarthy's as a yes. lobbyist in yeah. Maryland yeah. to, right. and you went to the convention. I guess I'm yeah. leading up to yeah. it. Tell us well, what went on. Brent tell Dillingham. us some of the an anecdotes about the convention. Uh, Brent yeah. Dillingham, Which, uh, I won't say Brent Dillingham was a god, but he's in my pantheon of important people that I've met in, in DC politics or Maryland politics. Uh, brilliant, iconoclastic guy, funny, um, uh, didn't, didn't have two nickels to rub together, worked tirelessly on various, uh, issues he thought were important. Housing was especially important to him. Uh, civil rights. Uh, he and his brother came out of this uh, fabulous Catholic education and they really took it seriously. And they were 
um, they weren't priests or anything, but they were like the best kind of Catholics you could have. That uh, they really, they were, they set a fabulous example. And Brint was was enormously funny, and I went with him to the Democratic National Convention, and we always got ourselves killed because he would kept making jokes with the um, guards people who were national guards, and we were. We were out in the park in front of the hotel, and you know it was like a police riot. And Brent had to walk up to them and you know give them a joke, uh, usually at their expense. And one time we were, uh, uh, let's see, the guy invited. We couldn't have a march, so this guy invited us to tea. Who Dick was Gregory. Dick Gregory? Said, "Okay, all you people, since you're you can't go on a march, I'm inviting you to my house for tea." So so thousands of people. We're heading in a direction, and there's a guy named uh, Clinton Bamberger who was with us. He was the um, uh, head of Catholic dean of the Catholic University Law School, and he he was like an old man, you know, he was like 60. And um, he said, um, "You're going to get arrested. Take my phone number. I'll come and get you out of jail." And so we, we said, "Fine, thanks very much. We appreciate that." And he said. Just don't say fuck Mayor Daly. He said, it really turns people off. You want people to support you. Just don't say that. So we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we went on about our business. And pretty soon, the jeeps came this way, and the tear gas was going that way, and we were stuck, and we were being bombarded. Now, um, I know Brent and I weren't hurt enormously, but Clinton Bamberger could not get away. He was stuck. He, I mean, he couldn't escape. And so he had made his way back up to us, and suddenly I hear this, and he really did get it, did get the tear gas. And I hear this, fuck Mayor Daly. And I turn around, and it's Clinton Bamberger <laughs> screaming. <laughs> I, and I almost want to remonstrate with her and say, what about the effects on the people at home? Um, and so we um, eventually, very late at night, they let us out, and we went back to our... You know, we, we slept on the floor of the Maryland Hospitality Suite in some hotel. The, the delegate, the Maryland delegation. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when the police riot escalated outside, and yeah. one of the people from the Maryland delegation, conservative Eastern Shore, uh, who was Speaker of the House, Thomas Hunter Lowe, yeah. uh, said what to you and Brent? Uh, he got furious and was yeah. just, he just leaving the convention. Right. Well, so actually, honey, you know more about that than I do. I mean, he gave, he gave Brent and I this key to this giant suite, and of course we let everybody sleep in it in the hotel. And then uh, John, my husband later, was reading a news story, and... It's in the Baltimore Sun, yeah. where Thomas Hunter Lowe, I was amazed that he had left. I mean, he was, he was a decent guy, but he was fairly conservative. I didn't know he'd be supporting McCarthy. Or, uh, and he, uh, he said uh, he was furious with the Chicago police, the whole Mayor Daley, he just, I said, I left the convention, I wasn't going to take part in that anymore, but I gave my suite to these two nice hippies. <laughs> and I didn't know Debbie at the time, and I didn't know it was Brent, he gave it to until about two years later, right. we pieced it all together. Right, and it was, right. It, and this, see, it was, it was um, despite the uh, police riot and everything, um, uh, we were working very hard for Eugene McCarthy, and we were making some we were making some headway with the Maryland uh, delegation. Actually, it was a very good experience. It was worth our while to go. Um, so, uh, when you came back, then uh, you joined Brennan in, in Compeers, right. and uh, there were a lot of s stormy things that happened right. there because of police yeah. action and the projects you were involved in. Tell a right. little bit about you know the. Well, Freedom the, House, Washington okay. Free uh, Press. Um, Comp Pierce was founded, I think, by some return volunteers who raised some money and they hired Brent, and it was to work with disaffected youth. I mean, that's what they said, but this, the youth that we had were not disaffected. They were terrific activists. They were kids who were, you know, just really with it. And uh, we took on the Great Boycott. That was one of our big issues, and we formed picket lines and did all kinds of stuff in support of it. Of it. And... Um, one time, uh, well, th there are a couple of actions that, that uh, uh, were just brilliant, where blood was to be poured on grapes. We were after a chain store to withdraw grapes from California. And so we picked, we, I mean, I didn't, but people who'd done a lot of research picked uh, the giant chain because there was a the family was very religious that owned it and they were Jewish and there was something about blood on grapes that was a no-no that was inflammatory. Yeah, Michael Tabor came up with that. Yeah, Michael Tabor who was working with us. And so we had a picket line out front and actually 
the threat of, we didn't have any blood, we had some red liquid. Uh, the threat of it caused the manager of the store to promise to withdraw the grapes. And so we had this great breakthrough. I think we were one of the first cities, major cities, to, to have a success like that. I mean, we were just thrilled because we weren't, we weren't that good, you know, and this was too easy. So um, anyway, and, and Brent and John, his brother John and Brent, I mean, we would go to Safeways with these kids and we'd fill up carts of groceries and then we'd say, oh, you've got California grapes. I can't buy anything here. And then we'd leave our carts filled with $200 worth of groceries and they'd have to restock, you know, take it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, was that effective? I hope, but I mean, we were searching for, for tactics. Yeah. I have a press release here from Compeers dated December 19th, 1968, Santa Claus's to picket international Safeway in oh, support yeah. of California grape boycott. Tell a little about that okay. uh, incident. Um, sometimes I felt like the only adult in Compeers because I was surrounded by these wildly creative people who were not bottom line conscious. And we decided we would have Santa Clauses in front of the Safeway in uh, Adams Morgan. We had 10 Santa Clauses, and I was responsible for getting the rental Santa Claus suits. The guy, it was, it was Christmas season, and the guy said, you know, I usually don't let one person take all my Santa Claus suits, but if you promise to get them back at 5.30, good. And if you're late, I'm gonna charge you for a whole nother day. Now, I don't even remember how much it was, but it was, it was more money than we had, and I had to go around and beg the money to, to rent the suits. And uh, uh, Martha Tabor, Michael Tabor's wife, brought from work a friend of hers who was an African-American. He donned this, uh, the Santa Claus suit and suddenly nobody paid any attention to the point of the, of the picket line of the, of the Santa Clauses. They saw this African-American Santa Claus and so people from all over the neighborhood were bringing their kids and you know surrounding the black Santa Claus and blah blah and it was getting very close to 5.30 and I had to get the suits back here to DuPont Circle. And I couldn't get Brent or anybody to pay attention to me. I was furious because they didn't care about money. <laughs> and anyway, so I had them strip right on the street. I took the suits and I went, you know, I took them back. And I, the guy, I don't think I made it by 5.30, but I didn't get charged another day. Yeah, so that was, so um, it was, I, I, I mean, I laugh about it now. And I actually haven't thought about any of this stuff for a long time. But we did everything on a, on a shoestring. We had, we had no money, we had no anything. But we, I mean, it didn't stop, it didn't stop anything. I mean, we just charged ahead. And the, um, the theatrical nature of so much stuff that went on in Compeers was just wonderful. Freedom House, all the, the kids themselves were very creative. I mean, and, and <laughs> hardly uh, fearing of authority, I can tell you. They just, they, they were wonderful. Brent during that period was arrested a number of times and one of them, yeah. the most publicized one was over the Washington Free Press where the Montgomery County Police actually seized issues of the Washington Free yeah. Press, said they were yeah. obscene and a, a, a circuit court judge had initiated yeah. a grand jury investigation of the Washington Free yeah. Press. It all seems in incredible, right. but it could, of course could happen again. Uh, and Brent deliberately stood out in front of the police yep. station in Bethesda to get arrested, and it right. created, from then on, a, a very a cause celeb, but a nightmare for, for yeah. Brent. Uh, right. Tell about those times. Um, it, 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 this is all tied up with the anti-war movement, too, because it was a judge who was very punitive to anti-war. Um, black people. Was, black people, it, but... It had a lot of... Yeah. Okay, so he, the judge was infamous, let, let's put it that way, and so he was an easy target. And um, so Brent uh, was uh, tried by a jury the first time? He first had a, a, just by a judge in the people's yeah. court, then he went to appeal to the circuit court and there was a jury yeah. and uh, I'm sorry to interject so much. No, but he please, was, I forget. Uh, there, it was, I wasn't at the trial either, yeah. but it was, very, it was a very disruptive with all the kids from Freedom yeah. House and that they had pig snouts and <laughs> jumping up on, I mean, it was really yeah. a, a circus trial right. at, at certain points. Right. Um, and He was convicted. He was convicted and the young people that we worked with were exceedingly fond of Brent and they did not want anything to happen to him. And uh, these were like juniors and seniors in high school in the main. And um, so 
Brent was facing jail. I don't remember how much time. Was it five months, maybe? Well, it's probably longer than that. Okay. But, yeah. but he was somebody who would not have survived in jail. I mean, I knew it, and I was no expert on these matters. He just would not have made it. And so in an effort to, I don't know, placate him or something, I raised some money and bought a little TV set, because you could take a TV set in with you to jail. And I thought if he could listen to the news, maybe he'd feel better. Well, I want to fast forward. When he later won a huge victory because he had this brilliant lawyer, and because of what he did was absolutely right, you know what the guy asked me? He said, can I keep the TV? <laughs> Brent, of course you can keep the TV. What are you talking about? The guy was so humble. And I wanted to bring up something that my husband reminded, or I, in talking to my husband yesterday, I was reminded of. There was this guy, a guy from, who lived in DuPont Circle, did not have a place to sleep. He was a black guy. And Brent gave him the key to our office that was at, next to St. Uh, Thomas Church. And the Church, guy, Church Street, yeah, there was our original yeah. office. And the guy lived there. And there was no problem. Somehow the church found out about it, and they kicked us out of our office. But that was very typical of Brennan. That's why I say he and his brother represented the best of the, you know, the Catholic left or whatever. Uh, uh, and uh, so, but anyway, so it, it, he had this fabulous lawyer, uh, constitutional lawyer um, Joe named, J named Joe Four, who got him off, and I was at that trial, and um, it was, uh, I, I don't think I've ever been happier than when he, they declared not only that he was uh, not guilty, but they annulled the law, this overly broad law that actually had caught him the, up to begin it's with. It's called the Ober yeah. Law, and it, and it was really yeah. the most anti-free speech law in the, the country right. that made you sign loyalty oaths if you were teaching at yeah. the University of Maryland. Or, yeah. uh, and, right. and so it overturned that whole law. And, it was uh, a hangover from the McCarthy era. Well, yeah. yeah, for sure. But anyway, so that was Brent Dillingham, fabulous, fabulous figure. Um, and. I'm the better for having known him. Yeah, that's. Uh, so where? What else? Where well, are we? we've. Uh, where are we? uh, <laughs> there's a few people. As, as I think you had said that, for you, this being involved in these various movements, the best part of it was the incredible people you met. And by the way, there were yeah. most of these people that you've talked about, except for Brent, were over 30. The people that you weren't right. supposed to. They were just the natural yeah, right. leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it goes without saying that uh, Washington had more than its share of great um, activists and activist leaders. Uh, uh, I know that for certain, Hobson and um, Sammy Abbott and Brent and a lot of people I'm forgetting, they had no interest in power. They were not interested in office. They were they were compelled to do what they did because it had to be done, and that was. The, and they happened to be brilliant leaders, and so they became. So a couple of people you haven't uh, talked about, but uh, were extremely influential and, and great. Uh, Hilda and Charlie Mason. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh yes, long long. Uh, she was what you call a. Um, she was in it for the long haul, and she did uh, stay in it in the long haul until I believe she was. Uh, I'll, I'll be, I'll be, no, no, sure. No. Okay. Um, late eighties when she died, maybe nineties. Hilda Mason. Oh, two, actually, two thousands. Yeah, Please. Hilda Mason was uh, a leader uh, in with Hobson for educational reform. Had been a prince, a teacher, a vice principal, ran for the city for the school board, and then ran for the council. All along, her big preoccupation was improving the D.C. public schools. One of her big accomplishments early on was getting a nurse in every public school in the city. The school system fought it, and we had to check on it because they were always pulling the nurses and, and saying they had them in the schools, and they didn't. But Hilda had been a vice principal, and she said it's absolutely essential for young women to have nurses in the schools, and then for little kids. So she, was, she wouldn't compromise on that. Um, she was married to a guy who uh, turned out to be well-to-do. I didn't realize how well-to-do they were, but they were generous to a fault. And, I, and, and what do I mean by that? They gave away money. They never told anybody. They never asked for any credit or anything in return. This woman and her husband were, I think, 
in retrospect, I think they funded a lot of the left's activities in Washington, D.C. And never, and nobody ever told anybody else <laughs> where they were getting their money. And they were getting it from them. Two, uh, uh, two things that stand out, but one is yeah. on that fundraising thing. Uh, tell them about the story of uh, the, uh, Lawrence Guyot, who was the head of the oh, Mississippi yes. Freedom Democratic okay. Party in 1964 yeah. during Freedom summer in Mississippi about his yeah. dealings with uh, Hilda. This is a great story. About and I was so glad because I, I, had, um, I, I had my backup. Hilda had died and nobody mentioned how generous she had been for so many years. So um, Free DC was having an event in honor of Hilda. Stand up for democracy. Stand, I'm sorry, yeah. stand up for democracy. Actually Hilda was still alive. She was. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So I don't even know why my back up was. My back was up because she was so generous and I wanted her to get more credit. She was kind of being ignored because she was old and you know, she wasn't participating anymore. So um, I talked about it and then this guy in the back, Lawrence Giat, as if like we had planned it, said, I want to tell you about Hilda in Mississippi. And I said, <laughs> wonderful. He had been head of the Freedom, uh, uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic, Democratic Party. Party. Yeah. And, um, they were always getting arrested and it cost $25 a pop to get people out of jail. They ran out of money. There was a white woman who was part of their group who knew Hilda and he, she would raise her hand and say, I guess I have to call Hilda. How much money should she send? And she would send down $75 or $100 in postal things and they would get it the next day and then they'd get the people out of jail. Okay, so Lawrence Giat comes to Washington D.C. to raise money for a the summer the freedom, freedom summer yeah freedom summer. He didn't know Hilda at all at that point. He just knew a name and that she lived in Washington D.C. So he can't get um, the Cedar Le the Unitarian Church on 16th Street to all allow souls, him to speak. Yeah. All souls. So he thought, well, I'm going to call this woman back in Mississippi who knows Hilda and see if Hilda can help me get into the church. He got Hilda's name and address. He called her. She said, I'm trying, he said, I'm trying to speak to this church. He didn't know that this was Hilda's church. So Hilda called the minister and said, if you do not let Lawrence Giat speak at my church to raise money for the summer, I will, Charles Mason and I will withdraw our membership in your church. Needless to say, Charles Giat spoke. Lawrence. And yeah, and Hilda and Charlie always sat up in the, um, up in the top and looked down. And Giat still had never met Hilda didn't know anything about her so he speaks and at the end this he said this little lady when this reedy voice said Hilda Mason and Charlie Mason will double all contributions up to thirteen thousand dollars he walked away with twenty six thousand dollars he said the most money I ever made for I'm for I'm sure for the summer maybe ever I think he was expecting 500 yeah or something. yeah yeah but you see I I cannot I mean, I, I, I get, I don't want to say I get weak in the knees, but that was the essence of Hilda Mason's genius. She, she had the means and she didn't, she lived very, very simply, but she made her means available in, in critical ways. And it made a huge difference in the history of the city. We'll, um Fifty-eight, fifty-nine oh, minutes. Okay, so we, oh. we go a little ten or fifteen. Yeah. Minutes. Um, the um, just uh, you're in, in 1972. You and I spent the year uh, traveling cheaply overland, hippie trail year. from <laughs> from yeah. London to mm -hmm. Nepal and uh, and India and back and in between and. Uh, so you weren't doing much of anything other than voting for George McGovern from London, right. I think. Right. Uh, 73, you went to work for, uh, we'll skip over this mm -hmm. a little bit, but you went to work for uh, Congresswoman Yvonne Braithwaite Burke. Right. And um, so much, if you want to stop it for a sec, so often as I've listened, I thought, you know, they should be sitting side by side because it isn't an interview. It is a discussion. Yeah. So I'd like that. John, do you want to move a chair over next I, to her and do this last? Should I do that or not? Um, you can go ahead and do that. Yeah, come over okay. here, honey. 
So I think in 1973, then you went to work for uh, Congresswoman Yvonne Braithwaite Burke, who uh, right. you can describe a little bit, bit about her, but there was one unique thing about her that was that you shared. Oh, right. We were both pregnant at the same time. And um, she was the first sitting Congresswoman ever to have a baby while wow, in the U.S. House of Representatives. And I just, one thing I remember, she's wonderful, wonderful, lovely um, young woman. But one time, I was slow getting back after giving uh, a urine sample at my doctor's office. And she just was furious at me because there was some deadline we were on. And, and I just had had it. And I said, well, listen, when you have to give a urine sample here in the Congress, a guy in a white coat comes to your private bathroom, gives you a cup. You use the cup, and you give it to him, and he goes away. I, on the other hand, have to go across town, wait. <laughs> For somebody, nobody gives me a cup, I have to, you know, I said, it's, it's a long, complicated thing. You don't understand what health care is like for most people. And I have a good, I have a good health care plan. So she listened to me. She didn't fire me, and she, she listened, and I think, you know, I, I had my one winning argument with her. <laughs> um, what, and for, she, you're doing constituent service yeah, stuff for yeah, her and, yeah, and that, yeah. yeah. Uh, 70, like 73, of course, uh, August, the twin boys of ours are born. And um, so uh, you left, uh, you continued to work there for seven Little or eight bit. months, I believe. Yeah. And, then, um, and then you left to stay home for, right. and, and then in 1975, events sort of overtook us. I was working at the Washington yeah. Post, yeah. September 30th. Went 1975 went to work the next morning learned that the pressman local six of the pressman's union and a number of other uh, blue collar unions who had gone out on strike mm -hmm. and uh, suddenly we had a decision and it was very easy for you to say of course you got out of the picket line where other people were all crossing it initially mm -hmm. many came out later but people on those first days were and I, I don't want to dwell on that too much, but some of the things that you did during the strike and uh, what it, uh, you know, what a bad scene it was. Yeah, <laughs> it, uh, this is a non-union town. People do not support people in unions. That was very clear very, very quickly. Um, one of the good things that came out of that strike, well, first of all, my husband stopped working at the Washington Post, and the second thing was they were having a demonstra demonstration, the striking uh, pressmen and other people who were on strike, in front of the Washington Post building, which has now been raised to the ground. And a woman named Josephine Butler spoke in support of the pressmen. She was the only person in town with any credibility or stature who braved the Washington Post and stuck up for the pressmen and said, the Post is wrong. Mm -hmm. So after she, sp I was so amazed that after she spoke, I think John had one baby and I had the other baby. We, I walked over to her and I said, um, I know who you are and I know you're running for the city council and if there's anything I can do for your campaign, let me know. The next thing I know, Joe Butler has moved her campaign into this very room <laughs> and my children in diapers are licking stamps and this doing promotions and I mean it was my husband had gone to Alaska and he came home and what did you yeah, find? This was in yeah this had been 1976 yeah then, and and Joe was a constant present before she was running for office in, in our house too but uh, yeah there was there were Debbie and Joe and Frank the three-year-old was off playing in the corner so but Tim was meticulously taking this thing and sealing envelopes and then stamps, he was putting on a little, putting yeah. on all the, so it was, uh, and. Um, and we would did very well. She would have, she would have won up the Democrats yeah. hadn't really brought a Republican into the race. To split to, the uh, vote. To split the vote. Yeah, that's um, how. But. Um, and, the, and at the, the, the time, the, yeah. The thing I was going to mention on the, 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 the strike, which we both became very much involved in, right. the support activities and met all the, the pressmen and others. Um, uh, but you, at one point, the, the pressman came under attack. The Post got a grand jury investigation because this, the strike had started 
with an incident which the Post always tried to characterize as some sort of destruction of the press. Yeah. Turned out later there was about $12,000 worth of damage. They moved, removed some parts that had to be replaced, but without those parts you couldn't operate. But the rumor, the story was the, uh, the pressmen destroyed the presses. Right. And they had, this grand jury and they, had the, they had the newspaper to print yeah, it. Yes, <laughs> the, the grand jury investigation into pressmen violence. Right. And all 97 pressmen were called to testify. They all took the Fifth Amendment. The Post would have all these headlines. It was a terrible scene, but the lawyer for the pressmen was somebody who was good on, uh, you know, labor negotiation stuff but didn't know how to handle but, a criminal. And you brought in, okay. you said to Jim Dugan. We were at a meeting and they were fussing over lawyers and how are we gonna pay lawyers? And all I could remember was this brilliant guy named Joe Four who had gotten Brent Dillingham off in the <laughs> Maryland Supreme Court and gotten this law removed. And I, and I said, you need Joe Four And David Ryan. And David Ryan. And actually it was David Ryan who took the case. But that, I mean, out of the mouths of babes, I didn't know what I was saying, but that lawyer saved the pressman's budget, future. I mean, it, he was, it was a brilliant matching of client to attorney, and they prevailed. They had, they yeah. had done a lot yeah. of labor work. They, of course, defended communists and, known, and, yeah. and people alleged to be communists over the years and always right. gotten the, the, the best deal possible on those. And, uh, and essentially, David Ryan, uh, advised them on testifying before the grand jury. They all remained solid. Nobody mm -hmm. said anything. And he also got the charges reduced way down. So one, uh, nobody from who worked in the press room that night went to, to jail. One guy who had assaulted somebody on the picket line did serve some time. But um, yeah, no, it was, I mean, because yeah. you, you really pushed, you said to Jim Dugan, the head yeah. of the, you, you, Jim, you just got to hire David he was a hard nut. He didn't listen to anybody, and he but said I was later determined. That that and of course, they, the, yeah. their, their whole effort at the strike was diverted to working to, to uh, counter the grand jury and to not have... Yeah. So at the yeah. one hand, you're, yeah. you're, you're trying to pick it and you're also right. being called before the grand jury. It was a... It was just, anyway. And they killed was, the union. And they killed... Yes, yeah. and they won. They yeah. won. We all totally. Won. We all lost. Um, but um, in this, when Hilda Mason again won and we're wrapping oh, up soon, she, yes, she and I Charlie cannot, and the University of yes, I cannot, Law School. I cannot finish this without mentioning again Hilda Mason's great uh, generosity and her husband's, which I did not know about until after they had died. UDC Law School, which today is one of the primary law schools of its type in the country. And it was the brainchild of Charlie Mason. And he gathered um, uh, legal scholars and people who know about law schools, and they blueprinted this law school. Public interest. Yeah, public law interest, school. clinical public interest, clinical approach to law. And um, it, it was created at UDC as, their, as a special school at UDC. And the city council, the money was tight, and the city council hated that law school. And they did everything they could to cut the measly one or two million dollars a year that, that was appropriated. And um, it was uh, Dave Clark, who was chairman of the city council, and Hilda, who had a vote on the council, and maybe John Wilson and a few others, Wolverine Rolark, Wolverine Rolark fought to keep it, even though it really hadn't come into its own at all. It was in very, very early stages. Um, then, um, we, I remember people coming in and saying to Hilda, Hilda, we don't need an, another law school. We have Howard University Law School. What do we need? We, what do we need a public interest law school? And, and then they would get issued into Hilda's office and they would talk long and hard about why we did need a public interest law school and that why Howard University wasn't a public interest law school. Anyways, time goes on and they survive really so I, I don't know that Hilda ever did any horse trading, but somehow they, they nurtured that little law school and it survived. And I want to mention too that yeah. the Washington Post editorialized yes. viciously against this law yeah. school. So right. Clark and Mason were irresponsible with yeah. the public purse were blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, at one point their accreditation was uh, an issue, but they didn't have a law school, library. 
So, and I found this out many years later, Charlie Mason wrote a check for $5 million and they got their library. Then a few years later, their accreditation was also in question because they did not have enough scholarship students. Charlie Mason wrote another check for $5 million, none of which was known by anybody at the time. The, I, I mean, in all of this discussion about the survival of the law school, nobody ever said it's because of Charlie Mason's contributions that it exists and, that it's, and it's now accredited. Um, and um, now, I, the last time I checked, which was probably a couple years ago, there are 18 people for every one spot they have in that law school. Be more, yeah, yeah and, and it's the cheap, one of the cheapest law schools in the country, and its faculty wins all kinds of awards for diversity and all kinds of things. So, it ha so in that respect, the monument, I mean, Charlie Mason's vision actually survived and it now exists in the UDC Law School. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know, we've been to a couple of graduations there and they have some fabulous uh, uh, graduates, but if you're a good organizer in this city, you can get free freight to that law school. I mean, Wayne Turner, who did the nuclear, uh, medical marijuana initiative, for three years for free. Uh, Chris Otten, but he didn't take advantage of it. He got a year, he only used a year. And I'm sure there are others that I don't know about. So it's a great um, asset for the city to have. I'm trying to remember the guy that's losing the name that he, he got very <laughs> yeah. much involved in the school uh, uh, construction issue, I mean, of, of rehabilitating yes. schools. Yes, and Mark Bourbet. Mark, uh, Mark Bourbet. Just told him, uh, the dean said, you're doing such great work and I know you're falling behind your school. Why don't you take the year off, yeah. devote your time to this cause, and then come back? Yeah. And he did exactly yeah. that. I mean, they're right. incredibly flexible. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we'll wrap up with just one other thing, but in the years since then, you've been involved in uh, hundreds of things, and including... Not uh, hundreds. Well, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, in, including, and you've been arrested a, a, a couple of times, uh, and yes. those, some of those are stories in themselves, but it's beyond the, the scope here. But the one I wanted to maybe wrap up with, and, and with, other than some telling about some of those, is the... Uh, you got involved in the nuclear freeze uh, oh, movement, yeah. and uh, there was an initiative for mm -hmm. that, and, and uh, that was another signature gathering. Yeah, we were very good at signature gathering. That is, that if, you, if you have to say, what, skill did, what skills did you develop? That would be the number one skill. Um, yes, and I do want to say with pride. This was 1982. By yeah, the that uh, Susan Abbott, uh, Sam Abbott's daughter, called me one day and said, I, you know, we, she was working in the suburbs on the nuclear freeze, I was working downtown. She said, Leonard Bernstein wants to give us a concert. Do we want a concert? And I said, Susan, I think we want a concert. <laughs> so a year later, both of us were uh, just, we worked so hard on this. And, and, and as I was saying to one of us today, when you're working as an activist and you're on a project and money is scarce and you can't hire anybody, then nobody says to you, are you qualified to do this? What is your background? What, you know, can you do this? No, you just do it. And this concert that we ended up doing was Hubert Leckie's cover, which won an award for the best cover for something or other, uh, resulted. And Susan and I and our little band of grassroots people, plus the help of the Blue Ribbon Group from the cathedral, who had contacts to all the Episcopal wealth in the city, we raised $168,000, and it went to four, was it four groups or five groups? Four or five in four or five the DC and the suburbs. The cathedral did not take a dime. We, we, had the, uh, we received a letter from, a, uh, from um, Bernstein's office saying we had the lowest overhead to profit thing, because we were all, um, one day, Susan and a group of people, grassroots people from the suburbs, we sorted 50,000 in, uh, invitations to this concert by zip code. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, that was, that was the magnitude. When they, when they broke at their uh, rehearsal from the first night, I had 60-some exits in the National Cathedral to plant a person by so the musicians could leave their, or their uh, mu uh, musical instruments safely in the cathedral. I mean, it was a gargantuan uh, thing. I would never do another one. but. We did raise a lot of money, and some peace groups had their whole year's 
you know, budget, budget covered. covered. This was yeah. January 8, 1984, and Bernstein had arranged for the cathedral. I guess they yeah. couldn't say yeah. no to him either. Yeah. And uh, Barbara Hendricks and Jesse Norman, Metropolitan Opera singers, also performed. Yeah. It was, uh, what was it, Mahler's? Mahler's Seventh Symphony. Symphony. Yeah. But it was, uh, again, your politics take you into weird places because the National Cathedral is not some place that I would expect to spend six months in. <laughs> and, uh, but it was very successful. Uh, we were very proud of it. Um, we, had to, we had to rent, I don't know, extra seats at the end. We were so sold out. Um, That's right. Yeah. And, oh, I know one, oh, one funny story. And you, I don't know whether this is worth putting into this film or not. There was a very persnickety woman from Georgetown who was head of the reception afterwards for the people who'd paid $150 for their tickets. Well, we were very volunteer heavy, as you can imagine. We needed really a lot of volunteers to put this thing together. And I wanted them to go to the reception. And I couldn't figure out, I didn't have $150, you know, to give each person. And so... <laughs> Somehow, we found another entrance to the reception. It was in this lovely garden at the cathedral. And, and, we, and we said, listen, just dress up a little nicely. Just go to the reception and say, you know, you, you gave your ticket to somebody else. And the woman, the, when we did a wrap-up the next day, this woman said to me, no, I had no idea so many people had paid $150 for the reception tickets. And yeah, Susan right. and I just sat there straight face. Mm, I know, it was so popular, it was really, mm. but it, it was, uh, it was, uh, and, and, and Bernstein's generosity in doing this, I mean, the whole thing was very special. Yeah, I remember they had the rehearsal the day before and the place was almost packed for the yeah. rehearsal yeah. for free. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> but um, I guess uh, we should really wrap up, and yeah. there's a lot of other things I really had here, but we, That's can, enough. we can put them at an asterisk someplace. No. Uh, but uh, of all of this, are there any particular things that stand out that you're particularly proud of that you did that you felt was really, uh, you know, that I don't. I don't think I'm so proud as I think I was really lucky to be here at the time I was here, and I am very sorry that my children did not have the same opportunity to be present in their city at a time when things are very exciting and things are looking up and people are, are optimistic about making, uh, making the city better. Um, I think, I mean, that's not original. Many people have commented on the, uh, uh, the lack of, the lack of uh, hope that people have. And um, so that, that I, I know that I, might, I personally was very lucky and I hope that, um, that I really, I, I think I had the stamina to keep up with it. You, you didn't need brain so much, it's that you just need stamina to keep up with what was going on. And, and I think I, I did that. And you need the cheap rents and cheap... Um, oh, that is <laughs> the other thing. Jobs. Why <laughs> it really couldn't happen again right here or anywhere near here. I paid $75 a month for rent. I had no utility bills. I did not have a car to pay for. I could do temporary typing two, days, two weeks a month and pay for everything and then be an activist. I had no college loans to pay off. I, I was fancy free in a way that young people cannot be today. And you need young people to do this, this work. So it's very different and I, I can't say it could ever happen again. So. I would go back to my, major, my original <laughs> statement, which is I was very lucky to be in Washington as a young person at that time, because it was an amazing time. Yes. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> oh, thank you <laughs> for listening. Oh, for God's sakes, it's going on. Uh, and listen, there's some lunch. We have some bean salad. Yes. I was, I was, maybe I was telling Bonnie, too, that uh, I, I think I told you that when we got this victory at the city council recently to oh, democratize wow. the... Uh, statehood uh, uh, constitutional convention process. They weren't going to have one at all before. Yeah. And uh, we walked on. I said, you know, I feel it's like a basketball team that's lost 50 yeah. games in a row, and we just won one, and we're not used to knowing how to. <laughs> 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 no, seriously. Yeah. It's, how, it's, how can you be? How are you happy? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, please, I'm going to heat up the coffee. We have some wine. We have a bean salad. Oh, yeah. We have tangerines. I was going to. Uh, uh, we have guacamole and chips. 
Yeah. As Dr. We're, we're heading into this. Yeah. Well, no, this is Oh, and I have a little bit more to tell, too. Yeah. About, you mean about, about money. Ladies. Yes. Yeah, she had been in the council for many years. Oh, you should mention you worked directly for her, yeah. too. I don't think yeah. you mentioned that. Um, I, I think we worked so hard on gathering the signatures. See, people thought we couldn't do it, but we did it. And that impressed Hilda, and so she hired some of us. <laughs> yeah, I know, we weren't all talk, you know. We were mostly talk, but not all talk. <laughs> So I think in 1973, then you went to work for uh, Congresswoman Yvonne Braithwaite Burke, who uh, right. you can describe a little bit, a bit about her. But there was one unique thing about her that was that you shared. Oh right, we were both pregnant at the same time, and um, she was the first sitting Congresswoman ever to have a baby while wow, in the U.S. House of Representatives. And I just one thing I remember: she was wonderful wonderful, lovely um, young woman. But one time I was slow getting back after giving uh, a urine sample at my doctor's office and she just was furious at me because there was some deadline we were on. And, and I just had had it and I said, well, listen, when you have to give a urine sample here in the Congress, a guy in a white coat comes to your private bathroom, gives you a cup, you use the cup and you give it to him and he goes away. I, on the other hand, have to go across town, wait, <laughs> For somebody, nobody gives me a cup, I have to, you know, I said, it's, it's a long, complicated thing. You don't understand what health care is like for most people. And I have a good, I have a good health care plan. So she listened to me. She didn't fire me. And she, she listened. And I think, you know, I, I had my one winning argument with her. <laughs> um, what, and for, she, you're doing constituent service yeah, stuff for yeah, her and, yeah, and that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 70, 73, of course, uh, August, the twin boys of ours are born. And um, so uh, you left, uh, you continued to work there for seven Little or eight bit. months, I believe. Yeah. And, then, um, and then you left to stay home for, right. and, and then in 1975, events sort of overtook us. I was working at the Washington yeah. Post, yeah. September 30th. Went 1975 went to work the next morning learned that the pressman local six of the pressman's union and a number of other uh, blue-collar unions who had gone out on strike mm -hmm. and uh, suddenly we had a decision and it was very easy for you to say of course you got out of the picket line where other people were all crossing it initially mm -hmm. many came out later but people on those first days were Crossing it. And I, I don't want to dwell on that too much, but some of the things that you did during the strike and uh, what it, uh, you know, what a bad scene it was. Yeah, <laughs> it, uh, this is a non-union town. People do not support people in unions. That was very clear very, very quickly. Um, one of the good things that came out of that strike, well, first of all, my husband stopped working at the Washington Post, and the second thing was they were having a demonstra demonstration, the striking uh, pressmen and other people who were on strike, in front of the Washington Post building, which has now been raised to the ground. And a woman named Josephine Butler spoke in support of the pressmen. She was the only person in town with any credibility or stature who braved the Washington Post and stuck up for the pressmen and said, the Post is wrong. Mm -hmm. So after she, sp I was so amazed that after she spoke, I think John had one baby and I had the other baby. We, I walked over to her and I said, um, I know who you are and I know you're running for the city council and if there's anything I can do for your campaign, let me know. The next thing I know, Joe Butler has moved her campaign into this very room <laughs> and my children in diapers are licking stamps and yes, during yes. promotions and I mean it was my husband had gone to Alaska and he came home and what did you yeah, find? This was in yeah this had been 1976 yeah then, and and Joe was a constant present before she was running for office in, in our house too but uh, yeah there was there were Debbie and Joe and Frank the three-year-old was off playing in the corner somewhere. but Tim was meticulously taking this thing and sealing envelopes 
and then stamps. He was <laughs> putting on a little, putting yeah. on all the. So it was, uh, and um, and we were, did very well. She would have, she would have won if the Democrats yeah. hadn't really brought a Republican into the race to split to, the vote. Uh, to split the vote. Yeah, that's um, how. But um, and, the, and at the, the, the time, the, yeah. The thing I was going to mention on the, 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 the strike, which we both became very much involved in, right. the support activities and met all the, the pressmen and others. Um, uh, but you, at one point, the, the pressmen came under attack. The Post got a grand jury investigation because this, the strike had started with an incident which the Post always tried to characterize as some sort of destruction of the press. Yeah. Turned out later there was about $12,000 worth of damage. They moved, removed some parts that had to be replaced, but without those parts you couldn't operate. But the rumor, the story was the, uh, the pressmen destroyed the presses. Right. And they had, this grand and jury they, had the, they had the newspaper to print. Yes, they, <laughs> the, the grand jury investigation into pressmen violence, right. and all ninety-seven pressmen were called to testify. They all took the Fifth Amendment. The Post would have all these headlines. It was a terrible scene. But the lawyer for the pressmen was somebody who was good on, uh, you know, labor negotiation stuff. But didn't know how to handle but, a criminal. And you brought in. Okay. You said to Jim. Dugan, we were at a meeting and they were fussing over lawyers and how are we going to pay lawyers? And all I could remember was this brilliant guy named Joe Four who had gotten Brent Dillingham off in the <laughs> Maryland Supreme Court and gotten this law removed. And I and I said, you need Joe Four. And David Ryan. And David Ryan. And actually, it was David Ryan who took the case. But that, I mean, out of the mouths of babes, I didn't know what I was saying, but. That lawyer saved the pressman's budget, future. I mean, it, he was. It was a brilliant matching of client to attorney, and they prevailed. They had, they yeah. had done a lot yeah. of labor work. They, of course, defended communists and known and, yeah. and people alleged to be communists over the years. Had always right. gotten the, the the best deal possible on those, and uh, and essentially, David Ryan. Uh, advised them on testifying before the grand jury. They all remained solid. Nobody mm -hmm. said anything. And he also got the charges reduced way down. So one, uh, nobody from who worked in the press room that night went to, to jail. One guy who had assaulted somebody on the picket line did serve some time. But um, yeah, no, it was, I mean, because yeah. you, you really pushed, you said to Jim Dugan, the head yeah. of the, you, you, Jim, you just got to hire David he was a hard nut. He didn't listen to anybody, and he but said I was determined. That, that, and that of course, they, the, yeah. their, their whole effort at the strike was diverted to working to, to uh, counter the grand jury and to not have... Yeah. So at the yeah. one hand, you're, yeah. you're, you're trying to pick it and you're also right. being called before the grand jury. It was a... Just, anyway. And they killed was, the union. And they killed... Yes, yeah. and they won. They yeah. won. We all totally. Won. We all lost. Um, but um, in this, what Hilda Mason again won and we're wrapping oh, up soon. She, yes, she and I Charlie cannot, and the university. District yes, I cannot, Law School. I cannot finish this without mentioning again Hilda Mason's great uh, generosity and her husband's, which I did not know about until after they had died. UDC Law School, which today is one of the primary law schools of its type in the country. And it was the brainchild of Charlie Mason. And he gathered um, uh, legal scholars and people who know about law schools, and they blueprinted this law school. Public interest. Yeah, public school. interest, clinical public interest, clinical approach to law. And um, it, it was created at UDC as, their, as a special school at UDC. And the city council, the money was tight, and the city council hated that law school. And they did everything they could to cut the measly one or two million dollars a year that, that was appropriated. And um, it was uh, Dave Clark, who was chairman of the city council, and Hilda, who had a vote on the council, and maybe John Wilson and a few others, Wolverine Rolark, fought to keep it, even though it really hadn't come into its own at all. It was in very, very early stages. Um, then, um, we, I remember people coming in and saying to Hilda, Hilda, we don't need an, another law school. We have Howard University Law School. What do we need? We, what do we need a public interest law school? 
And, and then they would get issued into Hiller's office and they would talk long and hard about why we did need a public interest law school and that why Howard University wasn't a public interest law school. Anyway, as time goes on and they survive really so I, I don't know that Hilda ever did any horse trading, but somehow they, they nurtured that little law school and it survived. And I want to mention too that yeah. the Washington Post editorialized yes. viciously against this law yeah. school. So right. Clark and Mason were irresponsible, yeah. but the public purse were blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, at one point their accreditation was uh, an issue, but they didn't have a law school yeah. library. So, and I found this out many years later, Charlie Mason wrote a check for five million dollars and they got their library. Then a few years later, their accreditation was also in question because they did not have enough scholarship students. Charlie Mason wrote another check for five million dollars, none of which was known by anybody at the time. The, I, I mean, in all of this discussion about the survival of the law school, Nobody ever said it's because of Charlie Mason's contributions that it exists and it's, and it's now accredited. Um, and um, now, I, the last time I checked, which was probably a couple of years ago, there are 18 people for every one spot they have in that law school. Be more, yeah, yeah and, and it's the cheap, one of the cheapest law schools in the country and its faculty wins all kinds of awards for diversity and all kinds of things. So it ha so. In that respect, the monument, I mean, Charlie Mason's vision actually survived and it now exists in the UDC Law School. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know, we've been to a couple of graduations there and they have some fabulous uh, uh, graduates, but if you're a good organizer in this city, you can get free freight to that law school. I mean, Wayne Turner, who did the nuclear, uh, medical marijuana initiative, for three years for free. Uh, Chris Otten, but he didn't take advantage of it. He got a year, he only used a year. And I'm sure there are others that I don't know about. So it's a great um, asset for the city to have. I'm trying to remember the guy that's losing the name that he, he got very uh, yeah. much involved in the school uh, uh, construction issue, I mean, of, of rehabilitating yes. schools. Yes, yes. Mark Corbet. Mark, uh, Mark Corbett just told him, uh, the dean said, you're doing such great work and I know you're falling behind your school. Why don't you take the year off, yeah. devote your time to this cause, and then come back? Yeah. And he did exactly yeah. that. I mean, they're right. incredibly flexible. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we'll wrap up with just one other thing. But in the years since then, you've been involved in uh, hundreds of things, and including... Not uh, hundreds. Well, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in, including, and you've been arrested a, a, a couple of times. Uh, and yes. those, some of those are stories in themselves, but it's beyond the, the scope here. But the one I wanted to maybe wrap up with, and, and with other than some telling about some of those, is the uh, you got involved in the nuclear freeze uh, oh, movement, yeah. and uh, there was an initiative for mm -hmm. that. And, and, uh, that was another signature gathering. Yeah, we were very good at signature gathering. That is, that if you, if you have to say, what skill did, what skills did you develop? That would be the number one skill. Um, yes, and I do want to say with pride. This was 1982. Yeah, that uh, Susan Abbott, uh, Sam Abbott's daughter, called me one day and said, I, you know, we, she was working in the suburbs on the nuclear freeze. I was working downtown. She said, Leonard Bernstein wants to give us a concert. Do we want a concert? And I said, Susan, I think we want a concert. <laughs> so a year later, both of us were uh, just, we worked so hard on this. And, and, and as I was saying to one of us today, when you're working as an activist and you're on a project and money is scarce and you can't hire anybody, then nobody says to you, are you qualified to do this? What is your background? What, you know, can you do this? No, you just do it. And this concert that we ended up doing with Hubert Leckie's cover, which won an award for the best cover for something or other, uh, resulted. And Susan and I and our little band of grassroots people, plus the help of the Blue Ribbon Group from the cathedral, who had contacts to all the Episcopal wealth in the city, we raised $168,000 and it went to four, was it four groups or five groups? Four or five in Four or five DC pieces. and the suburbs. The cathedral did not take a dime. We we had the uh, we received a letter from a uh, from um, Bernstein's office saying we had the lowest overhead to profit thing because we were all um, one day 
Susan and a group of people, grassroots people from the suburbs, we sorted 50,000 in, uh, invitations to this concert by zip code. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was, that was the magnitude. When they, when they broke at their uh, rehearsal from the first night, I had 60 some exits in the National Cathedral to plant a person by so the musicians could leave their, or their uh, mu uh, musical instruments safely in the cathedral. I mean, it was a gargantuan uh, thing. I would never do another one. But we did raise a lot of money, and some peace groups had their whole year's you know, budget, budget covered. covered. This was yeah. January 8, 1984, and Bernstein had arranged for the cathedral. I guess they couldn't yeah. say no yeah. to him either. Yeah. And, uh, Barbara Hendricks and Jesse Norman, Metropolitan Opera singers, also performed. Yeah. It was, uh, what was it, Mahler's? Mahler's Seventh Symphony. Symphony. Yeah. But yeah. it was, uh, again, your politics take you into weird places because the National Cathedral is not some place that I would expect to spend six months in. <laughs> and, uh, but it was very successful. Uh, we were very proud of it. Um, we had to, we had to rent I don't know, extra seats at the end. We were so sold out. Um, That's right. Yeah. And, oh, I know one, uh, one funny story. And you, I don't know whether this is worth putting into this film or not. There was a very persnickety woman from Georgetown who was head of the reception afterwards for the people who'd paid $150 for their tickets. Well, we were very volunteer heavy, as you can imagine. We needed really a lot of volunteers to put this thing together. And I wanted them to go to the reception. I couldn't figure out, I didn't have $150, you know, to give each person. And so, somehow, we found another entrance to the reception. It was in this lovely garden at the cathedral. And, and, we, and we said, listen, just dress up a little nicely. Just go to the reception and say, you know, you, you gave your ticket to somebody else. And the woman, the, when we did a wrap-up the next day, this woman said to me, you know, I had no idea so many people had paid $150 for the reception tickets. And yeah, Susan right. and I just sat there straight face. Mm, I know, it was so popular. It was really, mm. it's, uh, But it, it was, uh, it was, uh, and, and, and Bernstein's generosity in doing this, I mean, the whole thing was very special. Yeah, I remember they had the rehearsal the day before and the place was almost packed for the yeah. rehearsal the, yeah. for free. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> but, uh, I guess uh, we should really wrap up, and yeah. there's a lot of other things I really had here, but we, That's can, enough. we can put them at an asterisk someplace. No. Uh, but uh, of all of this, are there any particular things that stand out that you're particularly proud of that you did that you felt was really, uh, you know, that I don't. I don't think I'm so proud as I think I was really lucky to be here at the time I was here, and I am very sorry that my children did not have the same opportunity to be present in their city at a time when things are very exciting and things are looking up and people are, are optimistic about making, uh, making the city better. Um, I think, I mean, that's not original. Many people have commented on the, uh, uh, the lack of, the lack of uh, hope that people have. And um, so that, that I, I know that I, might, I personally was very lucky and I hope that, um, that I really, I, I think I had the stamina to keep up with it. You, you didn't need brain so much, you just need stamina to keep up with what was going on and, and I think I, I did that. And you need the cheap rents and cheap... Uh, oh, that is the other thing. Jobs. Why <laughs> it really couldn't happen again right here or anywhere near here I paid $75 a month for rent. I had no utility bills. I did not have a car to pay for. I could do temporary typing two, days, two weeks a month and pay for everything and then be an activist. I had no college loans to pay off. I, I was fancy free in a way that young people cannot be today. And you need young people to do this, this work. Mm -hmm. So it's very different and I, I can't say it could ever happen again. So. I would go back to my, major, my original <laughs> statement, which is I was very lucky to be in Washington as a young person at that time, because it was an amazing time. Yes. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> oh, thank you <laughs> for listening. Oh, for God's sake, is it going on? Um, and listen, there's some lunch. We have some bean salad.